Welcome to Path of Casualties and Filth. My name's Mick, I play Eldar, and this is the show where I hang out with friends and get a little less bad at 40k and other tabletop war games. Um, this is the first episode and sort of experimental pilot episode of this short podcast series. If this goes all right, I might record a few more episodes and see where this basically goes from here. Uh, it's also going to be a special fun episode because I'm starting things off with my friend Corey, who I've been playing 40k with for a couple of years now. Uh, so this is going to be a fun time. Uh, Corey, to get us started, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, um, I spent my life as a graphic designer by trade. I guess I was all, I grew up building miniatures and uh, your Millennium Falcons and your F-14s and all those sort of things you kind of do. And I guess I uh, revisited miniatures in the last five years or more. And um, from there, I, I picked up some 40k miniatures and got some armies and sold some armies and kind of settled into some stuff I finally like, I think. Okay. Did you find that that kind of, that it took you a while to kind of find your strider to find out what worked and what didn't? or? Yeah, there, I mean, there was some amount of buyer regret where you, oh, that looks cool, and then you get it, and yeah, you're looking at it, and it's like, oh, this is actually cooler. If I think if I had just sat down, put on some bricky videos, and got got a, a wide swath of the lore, then I think I probably would have gotten to where I'm to now much quicker. But, I mean, I, I did experiment with a lot of different painting styles. I painted a lot of green. I had uh, Dark Angels for a little while, and Iron Hands, and then I ended up settling on Death Watch, Sisters of Battle, Stodies, Krieg, I think, that's four armies now. Ooh. The the Death Watch always really stands out to me, because I think that was when, the first time that we did a game, and I can't, I think it was just you and me that did this, I can't remember if it was you, me, and Gerard, or if mm -hmm. that was something that came later. Yeah. Um, but I, I always think back kind of to that, that Death Watch game and where mm -hmm. it was basically a, a large mobile Eldar army and a small, relatively stationary army of Death Watch. Mm -hmm. And, um, I kind of love that that's how the game that we had a couple weeks back played out, but I guess we'll get into that more yeah. later. Yeah. Um, as long mm -hmm. as I can remember, you've had a bunch of different armies and factions going, mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about those and how you've built those or painted them up over time? Yeah. Um, I think the first army that I kind of fell in love with and said, like, this this is it, was Death Watch. And my, my consensus, I always say to someone when they say, I don't know what kind of Space Marines to play, is if you play Death Watch, you play all the chapters. So you can have so much fun, you can do all the stuff with pauldrons, Every characters, every every unit you can kind of treat as a character because they're they're all veterans. They've all been around forever. They're all the best that have ever been. So I think they're very ripe for kit bashing. I, I almost kit bash almost every unit now. So if I have five dudes in a squad, all of them kind of look like characters. Now it may be annoying to another player, and they're like, "What? Who? Who does what here?" Well, they all do the same thing, <laughs> but. At the same time, yeah. So the the but what I found with Death Watch and, and I'm learning now with Custodes, and it's an obvious thing, is less models means you have to play the game very differently, which is it's hard to score objectives. Uh, it's it's hard. You 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 can't cover the board. The modern edition of it rewards being everywhere at once and and contesting things. But man, if you if you're Unless you're playing 2,000 points, it, it's really, really tricky with Death Watch or Custodes to really do that. And you have to play the game a little bit differently. Okay. And how do you find that compared to, just as an example, when you're playing Krieg? Krieg, um, I probably should be exploiting the fact that the squads are just so cheap, you could take... 60 dudes if you wanted and just hoard the board um and there's probably some, nothing wrong with that and i mean the guard are getting a new codex they've gotten some 
data slate buffs and things. I mean, the the, the Homo last gun is becoming a, a serious threat now. Well, with what I've heard about the, the data slate, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess at the end of the day, if, you, if you're chasing rules and you're making decisions based on what is the most recent PDF or the most recent codex, I mean, these, these things fall out of fashion pretty fast. So, I mean, I, I, I think in the few Creed games I've actually played, I've kind of had a little bit of an equal mix of different things. Just because you can have your Sentinel Walkers running around, you can have your Death Riders, and you, you've got lots of mobility. You, you could have t- tanks in the back with, with a hundred inch range, just never move the whole game. So it, it, there's there, there are so many different options of playing things. There, there's one when you mentioned the hundred inch range. There's mm-hmm. one specific model that you have that I'm thinking of, and I think you've joked before that you could take this and fire into other tables and just get other players to like yeah. slide you like a five or a ten. Just do ten points. <laughs> I love man points, guys. Can I I can't even remember. I think it's like two hundred forty inches or something like that. It, sometimes it like fires outside the store. It and it's a brilliant model. Mm-hmm. Um, I also liked what you mentioned there about hoard the board. I mm-hmm. feel like Tyranid players and Orc players should just have that on a T-shirt. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> First issue, and you already got merch. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> oh no. And I did this... mention I'm a graphic designer. But... <laughs> oh, this is going to spiral dangerously out of control. Um, <laughs> um, all right. Um, the other thing I wanted to just ask you about briefly, yeah. um, out of the people that I do paint stuff with, yeah. you're probably like, the, the phrase that comes to mind is mad scientist, because sure. you have done a ton of different experimental stuff. Mm-hmm. Um can you talk a little bit about some of the weird things that you've done yep. to try and bring out detail or weathering or just make these models really pop? Yeah, I mean, I guess any I, I'm, I voraciously watch a ton of different YouTubers. And whenever I see something that I find interesting, I will see if I can find that product. Luckily... Half the time, it's something that they'll say they found at the dollar store or a craft store like Michael's or something. And, okay, I'll say, well, that's a cool technique or that's a cool product. How can I use this? Where where, where could this possibly go? And it's kind of a trick because I only play Imperium. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have the Tyranids. I don't have... The like I bought some uhu glue the other day. I have no use for this <laughs> whatsoever, and I'm sure sooner, very sooner and later, it'll make an appearance on something. And I've been like, oh, here you go. Uh, you got some tyrannids over there. You got some blood. You want to do? Well, let's get the uhu glue out because because I just want to see how it works. Yeah, but um, yeah, it, it, anytime there's pigment powders or shooting uh, inks through airbrushes or anything anytime something is going to be interesting and i'll certainly take the chance at it and i guess that the key is just not be afraid to fail because you can watch youtubers and man like every single video they completely knock it out of the park and and you 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 feel like that's what's going to happen when you do it too because you just saw the thing happen, and okay, there it is. That's what I'm going to do. And you do it, and it's like, no, this person has years and years of experience. They knocked out of the park because they had that experience. So yeah, that that's. I guess I I I just want to try as many different things and and not be afraid to fail. If you mess something up, throw it in some uh, uh, paint remover and start over. No, I, I think that's a great way to look at it. And um, the way that you're describing kind of comparing your work to people on YouTube or people who are winning like <laughs> golden demons and yeah. stuff like that sure. um, makes me think about like 
that Uncle Adam adage that uh, the yeah. what what was it? The price of perfection is prohibitive. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And at the same time, there's there's people out there that are are good at teaching stuff and are ready to set you up for failure. Uh, Vince uh, Vince Ventura or Ventura Vince Vince Ventura, I think is people usually call him. Uncle, or uh, what's it uh, they call him? Um, oh, guys at um, Captain or Plastic have a funny name for him. I can't remember now. Anyways, uh, yeah, Vincey, he, um, he's fantastic at teaching things and showing how simple it can be, but at the same time saying, I've, I've won all the awards. Like, it, it's, it's not a big deal. I, you, you just got to experiment and be a, and being and even you're going to learn way more from failure than success and sometimes if you do something and you fluke into success that can sometimes be worse because the second time you do it and it doesn't work you say oh my god i i don't, I don't know what i'm doing so yeah you don't you don't learn from your successes you learn from your failures yeah, I, I can 100% agree with that. Um, <clears throat> all right, so um, a couple of weeks, was it a couple of weeks or was it like a week ago? Time has no meaning anymore post-2020. <laughs> I think it was literally a week ago. Yeah, yeah, oh God, why does, why does it feel like it's longer? Anyway, <laughs> um, so we're going to talk today about a game that we did a week ago. Um, and we went with a match play game, which was, I think it was fun. Um, a lot of times, like when I play with you or with Brittany, yeah. we'll do like crusade games, um, and have kind of like running experience points and yeah. narrative and shenanigans. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was kind of nice to do this as a one-off, especially where Custodes was like a new army for you. Yeah. Um, Eldar had just gotten their ninth edition codex, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be able to test drive some of that. Yeah. And what we went with was the Eternal War Strike Force mission Vital Intelligence. We each brought 1,200 points of models. Um, the mission briefing reads that important tactical information must be captured. Key data terminals have been detected, but the machine spirits of several must be slaved to your data tethers at the same time if you were to intercept the intelligence you need. Um, basically, the way that this mission played out is we deployed on diagonals. We had a total of six objective markers. One was in my deployment zone, one was in yours, and the other four were evenly spaced down the middle. And the idea was that we had to capture these objectives um, and we would get points for um, controlling two or more objective markers, three or more objective markers, or controlling more objective markers than the opponent. Um, and it has some optional secondary objectives, but I don't think either of us went with those. Um, do you remember offhand what kind of secondary objectives you ended up going with? Yeah. Um... It was a little bit tricky. Um, I ended up picking um, killing more models, uh, slay the warlord, and I think there was another one involving characters as well. I didn't really have a lot of good options. There was no psychic in um, in custodies. There's a little bit of deny with sisters of silence, but I they're they're too cheap to depend on them actually pro practically doing anything and you need to spend command points to really make that sing and uh yeah so i i think it was those three i just went really simple and i said these are expensive guys they're probably gonna be able to kill some things and see where it goes okay i think i'm trying to think back as well to what i ended up bringing I know that I had Slay the Warlord, <laughs> which I did not achieve. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, I had Slay the Warlord. I had First Strike, which in retrospect I think was a good pick. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other one I went with was for holding half or more of the objective markers, mm -hmm. which could have been a good pick, but it, I guess, again, we'll get to that when we talk about how this played out. Yeah. Um, what sort of units did you end up bringing for this game? Well, 
we I think we initially talked about playing the thousand point game and I had a list put together that was like 925 or something and I was like okay well maybe I can stretch an extra terminator in here and, and fudge things a little bit to try to make up some extra points and, and but there were some units I still wanted to take this is the problem of playing the superhero army is that the uh, just just to unless you're going to do all troops and stuff like that it gets you have to make some hard decisions about okay well I'm going to bring in this dreadnought it's like okay well that's like 20% of my points gone uh, let's take another one well now I can't even play the game because I can't even fill the slot properly so then I, I, I suggested, um, well, let's make it 12, just so I have a few more bodies on, on the table that can actually do something. And, um, yeah, so I took uh, Tarjan Valoris, so he is the guy, he's like one of the main, he's like the main named character. And when you pick him, you don't get any, any options. You, if you use Battle Scribe, you just add him, and you can't click on him. You can't spend command points. You can't kill many extra relics. I think he has two warlord traits. They're already selected. You pick him, you're done. Um, he's like 160 points, and uh, he's just really good. He's he does all your rerolls for you, and. Uh, he does a lot of things that um, I didn't really get to use just based on the composition of the army, but he's, he's a fantastic model and he's pretty hard to kill, so I went with him. I had a five-person um, squad of Sisters of Silence. Uh, I knew that if you were going to be playing, oh, even if you had last minute handbrake turned on me and said you were going to play uh, something else, then I said, well, maybe maybe they'll still be useful as well. Um, so, yeah, with Eldar, I said, well, I, I, I think even if there's games where beforehand I'm playing against someone who's not doesn't even have Psychers, they're so cheap. They're, they're, they're the cheapest thing you can possibly take in this army. So even if you're taking them for the non-psychic uh, non shenanigan kind of things, they're just useful to have just um, it's, a, it's I probably need to get more of them to be honest with you to actually make this army work other it work in a way other than just shoot, just try to kill everything um, I had three terminators um, I think they're called the Lauren trans tra terminators I believe so they um, they can uh, teleport around as your typical um, terminators would do and I had three just general custody guardians um, with a guardian spear, and one had the, uh, the sword and the shield. I had um, this this nice little dreadnought guy. He's the sword and shield. Um, I think he's called the Galactus um, dreadnought. I had three jet bikes. Um, they didn't last very long. Uh, one of them did. One of one of them did. But they, they, <laughs> there, were, there was a few things that I don't want to get ahead of things, but there was a few things that were put on the shelf pretty fast. And then I had uh, the fun Telemon um, dreadnought, and um, he has a lot of points. And I think he he fills a very specific role. He's basically a tank. Uh, if you're if I'm if I was playing guard, he would pretty much operate in the same way that they. Uh, a tank would operate. I think he's 290 points or something wow. along that. Yeah, so he's he's uh, he's a serious investment. I don't think I would take it every game because you just can't you just can't build. You just can't do anything if you do that. And I mean, I think that was it. My troop slots were the sisters and uh, three uh, just custodians guys. Okay. And. What I rolled up with, and um, my my stuff is all craftable both way. Um, I brought a Farseer, a Spirit Seer, and the psychic powers that they had. The Farseer had Doom, Executioner, and either Smite or Fateful Divergence. I think it was Smite, though. I don't think I went with Fateful in this one. Um, and then the Spirit Seer had Conceal, Reveal, and Smite as well. Um, 
In retrospect, I don't think I did much with relics in this. Part of that was that where my army's got a new codex and I'm terrible at remembering rules, I kind of wanted to just make things a little bit easier for me to keep track of um, to mixed success. But again, we'll get to that. <laughs> um, for troops, I had two squads of Storm Guardians and each of them had two of the fusion guns because I love my fusion guns. Um, and for elites, I brought a squad of Howling Banshees, um, with one of the new fancy powers from the Codex, which I need to look up the name of because I can't remember it. It is, there we go, Nerve Shredding Shriek, which, um, has the potential to deal emotional damage. Emotional damage! Um... <laughs> but also um, can do mortal wounds. Um, it's kind of a neat, cheap, multi-purpose sort of ability. Um, but yeah, also equipped the Exarch with an Executioner. Other than that, they were just pretty straightforward Banshees. Um, brought Fire Dragons with the Exarch carrying a Fire Pike, and also brought along Wraith Guard and a Wraith Lord. Um, and I had this basically set up as two separate detachment units, or two separate patrol detachments. Um, the Wraith Lord was equipped with two Shuriken Cannons, two Shuriken Catapults, and a Ghost Glaive. Um, and the Wraith Guard were loaded up with Wraith Cannons. And the last couple of things that I brought were my Rainbow Falcon. Um, and I trying to remember. I had Scatter Laser, Shuriken Cannon, and a few other little add-ons on that. Um, and the Shroud Runners, I don't think you can even modify anything on the Shroud Runners. Those are just like, they are what they are, but I love them, and I think they're very cool. Um, so yeah, that's what I rolled up with. And before we get to the game itself, I do want to mention, just to like paint a picture in the mind thoughts of anyone listening, um, we played on a six by three table um, that Corey's got in his, basically his like gaming room in his, in his house. Um, and just gorgeous table, like stairs running down the middle of it. Um, half of it was like elevated, this really nice kind of like almost sector imperialis kind of look. Um, and the other side of the board was all forest terrain. I brought some of my Death World Forest stuff over, and you'd already built, like, a bunch of stuff on top of a battle mat that you had. Yeah. This was probably one of the coolest, if not the coolest, setup that I've ever played on. So mm -hmm. that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've talked about the game, we've talked about the armies, and now uh, let's talk about... Let, let's do the post-game thing. So... Mm -hmm. Um, how did this game go? <laughs> well, I mean, from my perspective, it was, I had never played Pistodes before. I had bought the Codex the day before. I had flicked through and watched some videos and just got myself up to speed at how their karate works and their martial katans and all these different things. And so... I, I was kind of like, okay, well, I, I got some cliff notes made here. Let's go. But what I what immediately started happening was uh, I just started putting away my army <laughs> after, after the first turn. So it's like, okay, well, uh, there was like a reveal that occurred and some bikes traveled four or five feet across the board. <laughs> And okay, it's, there's uh, Sister of the Silence. Okay, let's put that away. And um, some bikes. Let's put those away. Okay, yeah, this is this is getting expensive. And and I actually said to you probably at the end of the first or the second turn, um, everyone's loss is someone else's win because I, I I was like, man, he, he's got this. I mean, there might be a few things down the road that that it might be a bit of a challenge to deal with. But I, I saw the models going back on the shelf and go, good job. Spoiler alert, I did not got this. Uh, <laughs> there were some turning points. Oh, there were. Um, basically, where I remember it going from there was um, 
I'd moved basically my tank and the jet bikes onto your side of the board, playing the objective game. You obliterated my Falcon. Um, and Howling Banshees and the Spirit Seer came out of it. I had all of my other stuff just kind of grabbing objectives on the far side of the board or tucked away in the webway so that I could drop them on your side of the board as well, um, which I did the following turn. And I think this is where we get to one of the turning points mm -hmm. because I dropped both Wraith Guard and Fire Dragons in yes. and split fire, which was definitely one of the biggest mistakes that I made in this game. Um, because failing to kill your jet bikes, I think, was ultimately what cost me the game. I think that was one of the biggest it, things. It, it did a thing, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so... I also wasn't the only one with stuff... Um, going, back from the, going back in the box? Uh, well, yes, but also, I wasn't the only one that had stuff to drop in. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. And, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Um, tell us about the massacre. <laughs> well, well, which one? I, I, I guess the, where we, see, I mean, we, could jump, we could jump ahead of you. I mean, the bikes ran into your, your fire dragons. Um, or actually, no, the bikes were gone. And then I, I, I ran the, the bi uh, a bike into a building with the fire dragons and just swang a, a spear around and, and just deleted units. Later on, probably the one that you're talking about was a double run of the Galactus jumping in with the Terminators. And that Galactus with the auto hit um, within 12... Uh, it's just a, a chaff eraser. I mean, um, you went in, uh, you you got you dispatched the Terminators, and that was okay. Well, I was like, man, that's expensive. Okay, well, I, I was bold. There was only two of them, so it wasn't a big deal. And then the Galactus just, just went in, and okay, ten, 10 Eldar, gone. Okay, the next batch, 10 Eldar, <laughs> gone. Warlord, gone. And it's like... <laughs> You you basically Thanos snapped like, yeah, yeah. and my half of the board disappeared. <laughs> it was a Mister Clean Eraser of Dreadnoughts, yeah, for sure. Um, and while this was going on, my Howling Banshees made a charge into your Warlord, yeah. as did the rest of my Wraith Guard, or the last of my Wraith Guard, because you'd been picking some of them off. Um, your jet bike took out my Spirit Seer and then swung around. Yes. At the last minute, and one shot my Wraith Lord. Yes. Well, what was because I did to to make up some points. I did upgrade the salvo launchers on the uh, jet bikes. So jet bikes have different uh, weapons you can take on the front of them. And just to make up a bunch of points, I splurged and said maybe I need more anti tank in this than I think I do. Because, I, like I said, I never know what you're going to take. You you have a bunch of tanks. You've got all kinds of units. Your 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 collection for Eldar is almost like my Death Watch, where it's just like I, I have, like, m most of my room could just be Death Watch, really. <laughs> just because the Codex is so huge. And, and the same thing with Eldar. Eldar, Eldar stuff's been around forever, and there's so much metal and plastic and everything out there and, and resin that, yeah, I, I, I don't know what's coming. So... Yeah, the single jet bike went and got rid of all the fire dragons, and then he ran over to your your HQ character, not your warlord, but another another guy. He was a farseer. I think he was supposed uh, to be a character, not a character. Yes, or, or they no. were both characters, yes. but I was using the Eldrad model when it was just a generic farseer. Yeah, and I had a plan when I was still thinking that I'm um, I got to play this game the correct way, which is objectives. And I, I sh shot at that character and said, okay, well, I'll land some wounds. When charge comes up, I'll charge in. I'll charge right up to that objective. Oh, beauty. I'll handbrake turn right into it. It'll be excellent end of the turn. And what ended up happening instead was, I guess the overkill launchers I had on the bike just completely nuked that character so that I actually didn't have to go in the wrong direction. I just 
stay right in the middle of those steps and I didn't have the charge, which was huge actually, because then later on that that bike did something else completely <laughs> ridiculous. Um, and and to be honest, I mean, like I I had some clutch foolish rolls um, sporadically throughout the game, like oh uh, two d six shots, twelve, twelve, eleven, and it's just like like who does this? These weren't even re rolls. So um, at the same time, little one time rolls that like that that have huge effects. Where it's like you get so much utility out of a out of a, out of a single model, or something that that it's worth five models just because you rolled in a particular way. If I had four shots, okay, well, I'm gonna be here for an extra two turns dealing with this. You get twelve. Well, geez, I'm 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 accomplishing so much more. So yeah, the the the, the power of of just a killer roll um, that happened several times. And yeah, culminating with that jet bike running down the running down the steps, um, you could see a glimpse of that. Uh, your was it a dread knight? Uh, it was um, it was a wraith lord. Wraith lord. And the reason that the wraith lord was important was that at this point in the game, you had obliterated everything else. A lot of things had had been dispatched. Yeah. The the wraith lord was me trying to play for time hide it in the bushes yes. and hope that you couldn't kill it before we got to turn five because I was ahead in points yes. and you just one shot it. Yeah. Um, now the, in previous editions, I think in seventh and eighth and maybe up until very recently, I'm not really sure certain about the, the, the f full history of custodians in terms of metas and being good and not being good and stuff like that. I'm not hugely interested in that part perspective of it, but the there was a time where Captain on Don Eagle jet bike was like, or jet bikes in general were just like insane. Like in seventh edition, where you could just basically take anything you wanted to take and just cluster things together, you just like play all jet bikes and just run them up and down the board, just, just running through units and. Um, I, th I don't know if there's been point changes. I know there's been some rule changes and stuff like that. The OPSEC is gone and things like that. So they're not as good as what they were. And you don't see people taking the, the Captain on Don Equal Jet Bike as often. Uh, probably because of points and things like that. But like at the end of the day, mobility in an, in an army that doesn't have mobility is was huge. There was no way I could I could get three feet away to go and accomplish certain things I was trying to do if I didn't have those. So, yeah, I don't know. It's wild. Yeah, it, it was it was a wonderfully swingy game. Um, yeah. And with that being said, as far as this game goes, um, when you look back at this game, what sort of things do you think that you did really well? You have mentioned like the importance of fast attack units. Mm -hmm. Are there any other things that you found that you did really well or that you think of as being just really good moments in this game yeah well it was it was just a lot of happy accidents um there were things that were done mostly things that were done at the moment here is a problem i need to deal with that problem and oftentimes i'm not thinking two or three turns down the road which is what actual good players do because they, they would say, okay, I really need to get this gone, get this gone. And they can, for chess players, they can see three or four moves ahead. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there, there was some, some fluky dice. Um, there were things that I didn't expect. I mean, the, I had three of the um, Custodes troops... And I think they spent most of the game just sword fighting with um, with some of your guys. They were just the guardian squads were just not really doing a whole lot now. And in, in in all fairness, if they weren't there and there was something else, then I'd probably regret not having them there. Like it, it, it's it's that sort of thing of well, um, 
if I if I had had a certain unit instead, the whole game would have went completely differently. Um, what did I do right? I knew that the board was so big, so putting things in Deep Strike was important, and pff, I, maybe I probably could have done more of that. Now it turned out I didn't need to, but um, yeah, popping out around. I, I think that a lot of times. If you have everything on the board at the beginning of the game, there's a danger that you won't be able to cover it correctly, and it's just going to get shot off the board. I mean, you can just watch 300 points of something go away, and if you had the command points, just maybe not have them there. You do the gene stealer thing, which is okay. All all my models are in the box. Turn one, shoot at nothing or whatever. That 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 kind of mentality. Uh, luckily for me. Uh, I didn't have um, anything to spend command points on. I had a, a single HQ, and I could I wasn't allowed to spend anything on him. And there wasn't there was a couple of like little um, stratagems I could use pre-game, but I ended up with more command points that I could use than I could ever use, which is hilarious because I I was getting free. I had a, a relic or the Tarjan Valoris was letting me keep command points so i had too many and i was keeping them it's like well okay we'll put all this stuff in deep strike because at least then i have some options later on and mobility so and out of the units that you did end up bringing mm -hmm. were there any that really stood out to you during this game as this this was the unit of the game this was the mvp yeah um i mean the easy answer will be the, the galactus drive not he's he's expensive um but, he, and, and he rolled foolishly good. And in another game, I'm sure the next time I run him, he, he won't roll that well. And he'll be like, eh, nah, nah, nah. But at the end of the day, he got an, an, uh, he's, he's getting shinier paint jobs now because he, <laughs> he's, he's, a did good, he's a did good unit, right? You, you got to reward that. Yeah, he got some extra decals. Like it, it's, it, it, it's, he's getting a reward for a job well done. And, and that's, always, that's always a great thing is when you, um, ha when you do something with a unit and then it's like, oh yeah, that, that, guy, that guy, right? That, that's my guy now. And, um, and sometimes the opposite happens where we, me and you have a funny thing with the, when we play in our crusade game with the, my dreadnought who's the primary dreadnought, who's just a constant problem. <laughs> and you, you've blown him up once, and I made a, I made a, an agreement with you, with you that every time you blow him up, I'm going to pull the shoulder pauldron off, and I'm going to paint him as a different chapter. He's going to be... So every time you kill him, you're going to be... I'm, I'm going to have to literally have to repaint that pauldron. Yeah. You're, so you're bringing a back guy. a different, like, yeah. marine. Yeah. And, uh, there, and, and uh, I'm hoping that, like, there may be a sense of accomplishment. If you've killed him, then... And I'm gonna make him paint that tonight, <laughs> <laughs> giving the incentive to go after the dreadnought. Yep. But I know, like we played some games, that that freaking thing, which hilariously was a um, a thing I hadn't anticipated. Was when I put it in, the, I took an all primaries. I'm getting a little bit off topic here. I took an all primaries Death Watch um, uh, Crusade you the group. Just that I didn't play a Primaris a whole lot, and suddenly they became good. The rules changed slightly, and and units that were not great became like super metas. So yeah, that's just the way of things. Yeah, units that did, did well. Did, did, I wouldn't have been anywhere without those bikes or that bike. I guess I could have just taken one. <laughs> <laughs> Telemon. I mean, uh, the the range that that thing could shoot, and and just just delete was great and i mean it's easy to, to bypass the chaff and say like well uh if i'd had those sisters of silence that were on the board for about four minutes um they didn't do anything but at the end of the day maybe they did because they caused you to spend a psychic power to reveal them and then you ran in and you spent a turn shooting at them and then when you when you deleted them the first question i was i asked was how much did those bikes cost because at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. Did you spend more points to get rid of less points? And um, that's an interesting metric to really value the cost of something. 
right? If you had a bunch of Gretchen that all cost you two points, but they they costed they they cost way more for someone to to get rid of. That's probably a win. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And sometimes it does kind of come down to playing that points game. Mm-hmm. Um, on my end, in terms of what I did right, I'm gonna I'm gonna brag about this. I'm usually terrible with deployment, and we've talked before about how I'm not the best at deployment. But I feel like this was one of the first games that I've run where I went in with a plan. I knew how I was going to deploy, um, and I feel like this time it just worked. Um, like, and. Part of what we'll talk about later on is that I definitely got greedy after that first turn, and things were going a little too well after that first turn. Um, But I I think it was just one of the strongest standalone turns that I've played out of the gate. And arguably, I did spend more points on getting rid of the Sisters of Silence than needed, but for me, yeah, it was the idea that they had to go because with the psychic units that I was using, I needed to make sure that those weren't going to be hindered. Um, and also it was nice to be able to take them off an objective and to kind of shake up the objective thing early in the game, especially by taking objectives on your side of the board. Um, and going back, uh, to the question of MVP units, I think for this game, I would have to give it to the Shroud Runners, um, because like... Arguably, the only thing they totally took off the board was the Sisters of Silence. But um, they just, they were a nuisance. Um, and I i kind of loved just being able to roll that many dice for all those scatter lasers. Yeah. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Feels good. Um, but yeah, and, and I just, I like them in general. Like, a lot of the new Eldar models are re-releases of old things. Like, mm-hmm. You have the new Howling Banshees that came out with the um, Phoenix Rising stuff. You had the Dark Reapers, the new Avatar of Kane. These are all things that have been around for decades. Yeah. But Shroud Runners, I think, are the first like new thing that we've had in, well, basically since Inari. But Inari, I feel like, is kind of its own separate like thing, but arguably Eldar. Um, anyway. Yeah, I liked the Shroud Runners. Um, and in terms of other stuff, I think the Fire Dragons and Wraith Guard could have been good or could have been M- MVPs if I'd used them better. Um, and with that being said, let's move on to things we did wrong. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> uh, is there anything that you think about from this game that struck you as, why did I do that? Um, or was this a game where, like, you found that you generally had very few regrets? Were there any units that underperformed? Anything like that? Uh, I mean, for the most part, back in, in, uh, I kind of asked backwards, fell into everything's coming up Millhouse by, by just, like, I mean, yeah, should I have had those sisters right on that objective to start the game? Probably not. But what I found was uh, I actually didn't have where I where my diagonal, the way it kind of landed, I didn't have as much cover as I would have liked. Um, because, I mean, if you're playing, if you're if you're not first, you've got to play that defensive game. And I looked at it and said, well, if I don't put these sisters on on that objective... It's going to take me a ton of time to get them to it. So I said, and then I thought about it as well. I thought about their deny range. And I said, I, I can't bury these units. I got to put them out there. And did I expect that you were going to run up three feet and then like <laughs> supercharge and advance and, and wipe them out? Not at all. I never could have, could have seen that coming. But at the end of the day, the... They may have actually done more than I, I think they did, just because if they weren't there, what would have those bikes done instead? Yeah, well, like you had mentioned earlier, if like if the shots hadn't gone into the Sisters of Silence, they would have been going into something more costly. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And the thing is, 
let's say, for instance, you got rid of four of them, and I still kept the leader there, past morale, and then no units on a objective is a big difference between one unit on an objective. It's almost kind of like a, we're in eighth where I'm just going to walk this one guy up to the tank and the tank can no longer do anything. Yeah. It's, it's just that, that power up with one unit left. H had you not gotten rid of all of them, then you may have had to go and come up with it. Okay, well, I really still want them gone. What else am I going to do? Um, yeah, mistakes. Um, no, I, not, not to brag, but like, I, 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 I didn't, I didn't have any huge follies. It was a bunch of flukes that ended up going okay. Um, that certainly doesn't happen every time, especially when you're playing uh, an army you've never played before. And, um, I'm sure if any real Custodes players had watched this, they would just shake their head and go, man, what are you doing? This is this is this is the worst decision you could possibly do, but between some lucky dice rolls and just just the way that certain that certain things pat, panned out, I, I don't think I would have necessarily done anything wrong, or done as sorry done anything differently. Um, but like I said, it, it was it was just a a bunch of happy accidents, one after another. Yeah, and like. From where I was sitting, especially as the game went on, like you were playing a very solid game with very solid custodies. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest thing that I think I did wrong, and we've talked about this, we were talking about this on the way here, mm -hmm. um, splitting fire. When I dropped the Wraith Guard and the Fire Dragons in, the combined firepower of those two units would have obliterated anything, but instead, I split them in two different directions, one going into the Telamon Dreadnought and one going into the jet bikes, and they obliterated nothing. Like, you lost two jet bikes, but then again, like, as you were mentioning with the Sisters of Silence, if you have just one left, you can still do a lot with that. Yep. Um, and, like, failing to take out that squad of jet bikes meant that you were able to basically Tokyo drift them all over the map and just clean up units that weren't ready to deal with them. Yep. Um, I think what part of this, um, I, I think if I had to address like the underlying theme or the underlying thing I did wrong, it's I got greedy. Uh, the first turn went really well. And I thought, well, I can take more objectives, I can go in more directions, I can take down more units, instead of just keeping a level head and thinking, okay, if I take down the jet bikes, then I can park on the objectives that I've got right now, play to time, etc. Like, there's, there's ways I could have mm -hmm. made this work. Mm -hmm. um, I also made what in retrospect was the bad decision of trying to move my Wraith Lord over onto an objective marker. When, if I'd had that closer to the rest of the troop units, that was like the one thing on that side of the board that would have been able to stand up to the yeah. stuff that you deep striked in. Um, because the Wraith Lord now, like with the new profile, it's, it's just a terror in melee. Yeah. Um, but we didn't get to see any of that because well, I had concerns. I, I saw the, this big spiky thing with a sword and guns coming off it in every direction. And I'm like, yeah. I, 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 it, it's great that I went in and got rid of these like chaff units, but that thing's coming. And yeah, uh, there, there's... And that, that, that brings up an excellent, excellent point. Which is, when you're trying to score objectives... What what is the cost of an objective? Yeah, points, and it's great for you to have a tank or some big dreadnought or something, but if it's not doing anything and it's just sitting there to gain you five points, and it ends up losing you unit after unit because you're you got three hundred points of something or two hundred points of something sitting there gaining you five victory points, 
man, like now in 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 that thing's defense, I mean it did have weapons that it could it did fire and stuff like that. So it's not like a it's a big dreadnought that just has melee weapons and you're just parking it away from everybody. I mean that that would be the a, the travesty if um like if I had the Telemon, you can put two melee weapons on this thing. Yeah. And you could you just walk it into things and it just it just uh ginsu's everything. Um and like I'm I'm sure that there's games other people have had where they've had the big um melee unit and they just park it on an objective away from nobody because they're trying to score the points. But it's like that is a huge investment of points to to maybe get you a few more points that may or may not win you the game. Yeah. Right? Um that's uh, the same same thing. If I had taken this Telemon, parked it on an objective but then had no line of sight to anything in the game. That's like a quarter of my points wasted on just getting some victory points when one of these girls just sitting there yeah. left over is doing the same job. And that's 16 points as opposed to like 300 points. Yeah. So yeah, that that is that is a real huge consideration. But like I said, it, it's it's that hindsight thing. Yeah, did those, did those five victory points end up end, end up winning someone's game, and the, the, did that three hundred point dreadnought sitting there actually like it, it's yeah, you don't know, right? You don't know how how things are going to actually pan out, especially in earlier in the game. Yeah, and and I guess to kind of like pivot into things that like we would do differently mm-hmm. if we had the chance going forward. Um, I guess if I was going to redo this the first turn went well because i had a plan and i stuck to that plan yep. and i think if i had stuck with that plan and not started making new plans or overreaching or overextending myself into taking things on the board that i didn't need to have yep. then this would have ended as a very different game uh, but in all fairness as much as this was my first time running to so days this was your first time playing them playing true them. so it, 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 to you, you might have seen the Telemot and, and said, oh yeah, that, that, that thing is just going to destroy the game. When in actuality, it, the Galactus did way, way, way more. Um, and, and I remember um, one of the first games I've ever played a 40k in, in a store, a store demo, um, it was very funny because the, the store demo didn't have any of the correct models for things. So you're like, oh, this is going to be that. And the person I was learning the game with uh, just pointed out some things. But the wimpiest little tiny model that on the board that they had laying there was like a 300-point model. And it was just like, I paid no consideration to it at all because I was like, yeah, whatever. I'm not going to worry about that thing. When in actuality, I looked it up after what that model was supposed to be. So sometimes the optics of things, when you look at it, it's like, yeah, those that Telemon looks like it's a big deal. Eh, maybe the bikes are going to be a problem. And yeah, bikes ended up probably being way more of a problem. Imagine turn one or turn two, you had not gotten rid of the other two bikes, and then they ended up down with your warlord, and yeah. down with the with your um, with your other dreadnought. I mean, serious business. Yeah, I think what you did well was was getting rid of the jet bikes, because. I think they they solve a lot of problems. Yeah. And I think if I had, like, my time back, I would have had the Wraith Guard, instead of firing into Telamon, fire into, like, even though it would have been overkill, firing into the jet bikes just to make sure that those went down. Yeah. Kind of goes back to the discussion we had on the ride over here, which was, like, is not knocking something down a profile... Like, uh, let's say, like a knight or this telemon or something, is knocking it down a profile and spending all your resources to knock it down a profile actually accomplishing anything? And luckily, in 40k, they do have profiles for vehicles. All other games don't. And when they don't, then if something takes you half the game to get rid of it, and it's still always, even when it's almost destroyed, still operates under the same values as when it was brand new. Then yeah, it's unless you're committed to completely getting rid of it, knocking it down wounds will probably accomplish nothing. And I, I've played really good games with you where you have ignored, and I and I've and I've watched other games with other players where 
something has a ton of wounds and people say, I am not even going to bother with it. It's a waste of effort and a waste of time for me to spend all day shooting and, and losing resources to this thing rather than, you know what, I'm just going to make sure that it doesn't have a great line of sight at all, uh, the best of my stuff. And he's just going to waste all this time picking suboptimal targets and moving to try to get better things. And I'm just going to outmaneuver it and it's, it's going to be a waste of points on their part. And I, I think that's sometimes the best way to deal with uh, a night situation or a, 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 an overcosted unit is, yeah, I'm just going to make you waste, waste it by shooting at things that it's, it, it, it should have no business shooting at. Yeah, or just find ways to mess with it or find cheap ways to mess with it. Sure. Um, I mean, that's very dependent on the board because if you got some amount of cover... Um, what with a plus one your AP is that going to matter against the, the the weapons that some of this stuff has? Yeah, not at all. But if I put it behind a building, you can't. See it. If I put these units behind a building entirely, and you can't see it. Well, you have no shot. Right. So I'm not even sure what our question was, but that's where we're too. <laughs> no, I, I think that's fair, and honestly, I think that pretty much covers our post game. I I think we've like gone about as in depth with this one as we can and i think there were some good lessons learned on this mm -hmm. um so just before we wrap up um in terms of like either graphic design stuff or 40k stuff mm -hmm. um is there anywhere um that listeners can find your work like on social media or other places or yeah i do have an instagram where i i put stuff from time to time, I go under the name Kinpatsu Samurai, blonde headed samurai, K I N P A T S U Samurai. Um, and that's probably the only place I think I put some pictures on Twitter and stuff like that, but that's just a place to get into arguments with people, so I, I'm not getting into that racket. Yeah, Instagram <laughs> is probably the, 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 the safe space for, for art, I think. Okay. I, I too am afraid of Twitter. Um. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I think we should be all set from there. Uh, thanks for doing this today and having me over and for the quesadas run that we did before this <laughs> and, uh, for a fantastic game. Yeah, thanks. thanks for listening to this episode of Path of Casuals and Film. And a big thank you to Corey for joining me on the podcast. Intro and outro music for Path of Casuals and Film is Coral Reef. DJ Cutman's free to stream album. If you want to see pictures from these games or pictures of some of the miniatures work I've done, you can find it at www.thebigdresses.ca, where you can follow my social media links to my YouTube and Instagram. Stay safe, stay casual, and above all, stay filthy.